Um, actually, Mr. Falkas promised me that the room will be full this morning, but it doesn't look like that. Uh, has anybody an explanation for this? I mean, normally I believe uh, all the promises from Mr. Falkas. <laughs> What's the reason why your colleagues are not here? I mean, I can, I can guess the reason. Uh, okay, so today we are going to talk about radial basis function networks, but before let me uh, skip back a little bit into uh, Bayesian linear regression. Oh, so the room is going to fill up a little bit. Um, yes, so I want to repeat um, what we did there. And maybe even, yeah. Um, Hmm, where should we start? Yeah, let's go into maximum likelihood again. Yeah. Yeah, let's start here. So this is uh, just a repetition of what we did the last two weeks. And I mean, I'm really committed to get this into your brain. Uh, because it's, it is important. Regression is really important for applied mathematics, no matter what you're doing. Uh, it's, it's important for computer science, it's important for electrical engineering, for mechatronics, for physics, for mathematics, even for psychology. Everybody needs this. Yeah? Um, maybe the psychologists, they don't want to understand what's going on, but you are not psychologists. Yeah? Okay, so what we did, what we did here uh, in maximum likelihood is, uh, given such a set of data points, and we assume that there is some underlying function. Actually, here the underlying function is such a sine function, and the points are produced from the sine with some added Gaussian noise. But in the application, it's not important to know, I mean, uh, no, in the application you do not know the underlying function. And the goal is to approximate this underlying function. Okay. And now, what we do is, we assume that these points have been produced from some function with some added Gaussian noise. And, I mean, this assumption of Gaussian noise is quite realistic. In, in very many applications, the noise really behaves in a Gaussian way, or very similar to Gaussian. Um, and, yes, I mean, you know the reason why this very often is Gaussian noise. Or, do you have an idea? Think of the central limit theorem. So suppose there is some underlying function, maybe such a sine function, and then there is some process that produces noise. I mean, it's not always the case. I mean, this noise may be non-Gaussian, but in many applications, it is Gaussian. What may be the reason for this noise being uh, normally distributed? Be behave like random. Like random, yes. But, I mean, when we talk about like random, then um, 
such a distribution also is like random. Uh? So if this is our variable x and here we draw the density p of x, this is also like random but it's not Gaussian, not at all Gaussian. I mean in statistics we are talking about random variables and the density function of such a random variable may be anything. But why is in real applications the noise uh, very often uh, Gaussian distributed? That's a good idea. At least you remember the assumptions for the central limit theorem. Huh? We need to have, what is the assumption? We need to have n independent identically distributed random variables. Okay? Yeah. So that means you, we are not talking about one variable. We are talking about many random variables. And they may have this density function. And uh, look, all these error variables. Um, yeah. So, epsilon 1 comes from some, some probability distribution. And epsilon 2, our second error term, comes from the same density function and so on up to epsilon n. They all come from the same probability distribution. And now very often it is the case that the total error epsilon is equal to the sum i equal 1 to n epsilon i. And if this is the case, if the error is a sum of individual error terms and if these errors are random, which means they are independent, but they come from the same distribution. And if this n is not too small, uh, then the, uh, the central limit theorem tells us that the resulting density converges to a normal, density, uh, to a normal distribution. That's, that's the point and that's why Assuming Gaussian noise is quite realistic in many applications, not always, but often. Is this clear now? I mean, you see how really fundamental and basic the central limit theorem is. I mean, that's why it's called central limit theorem. It's really in the core of applied statistics. Okay, so that's why this assumption here is realistic. Look, this assumption is why i it, is this axis is such a vector of coefficients time a vector of basis functions. So, I mean, actually, we, what we have here is a linear combination of basis functions. I mean, this is now really uh, our everyday uh, stuff we do all the time. Plus some Gaussian noise, epsilon i. So this index i here, it's not this index. Huh? So this index y i is just the index for the points. So point number i um, is, comes from something like that, from such a linear combination, combination of the basis functions plus um, the Gaussian noise. Huh? Oh my, I mean, here we shouldn't say it comes from. We want to approximate such a linear combination of basis functions to our underlying functions. And in real applications, often you have no idea what's the underlying function. And we will today look at a concrete example uh, where we use radial basis functions as such basis functions. Okay, and then, I mean, then now we did the maximum likelihood regression and maximum likelihood basically is we, we compute the probability 
for observing the yi and this means the probability for observing these data points and actually the probability for observing all these data points so if these, these are 200 points then we calculate the probability for observing all these points um, given our parameter vector a that's what we have here this yeah this is the probability for observing one point yi and now we look at the probability for observing all the points this is the vector y with all the points and if um, they are independent then we can just write this as the product of the individual probabilities and, and now we maximize this probability so, uh, with respect to our parameter vector a so we determine this parameter vector a such that the probability for observing all these points becomes a maximum that's what we did okay and um, then uh, yeah we we applied it and we saw such results so the underlying function was a sign and we fitted ninth order polynomials and uh, depending on the number of points we got such results here it looks quite nice here it does not look nice at all and the reason for this is uh, that's the so-called overfitting effect um, if you just look at these blue points and you fit a polynomial of degree 9 it's not so surprising to get uh, such a result in particular uh, because we, we have done polynomial interpolation and what we get here as a result actually is nothing but polynomial interpolation you see this ninth order polynomial hits all the data points we actually do only appro approximation not interpolation here what is the reason why this polynomial hits all the points we don't do interpolation but our polynomial hits all the points The reason is because it's only six points. It's an underdetermined problem and there, there are infinitely many exact, exact solutions and maximum likelihood uh, produces one of these infinitely many exact solutions. And it's not surprising to get, uh, that we get such an exact solution because maximum likelihood maximizes the likelihood to observe all these points. And of course this is a maximum. Huh? And now as we increase the number of points, how many do we have here? Two, four, six, eight. Um, we still hit all the points. Huh? And it's not surprising either. How many points? Ten points. We still can hit all the points. It's not surprising again because a polynomial of degree 9 has 10 parameters. And now as we have more points, we can't uh, hit them anymore. Yeah. And now what happens as the number of points becomes large, we get some smoothing. Yeah? And I mean, of course, it's not a good idea, typically it's not a good idea to use a polynomial with a degree which is higher than the number of points. Yeah? Typically the degree of the polynomial should be much smaller than the number of points. But I mean, polynomials uh, can be uh, really inconvenient, sometimes even ugly. We have seen this when we did polynomial interpolation. Um, okay, yeah. 
So, so much about maximum likelihood. What we then did next is we did Bayesian inference. Uh, um, and we decided no longer to maximize the likelihood which we have here, which is the probability of, of observing all the points given the data and the parameter. Uh, what we now do is, or did is, we maximized the posterior probability, which is this. Probability for observing the parameter given the data x and the y values. Uh, and this is actually more natural and uh, using the, the base formula um, we can uh, take the likelihood function which is this here, multiply it with the prior the prior over the parameters and then get the posterior uh, probability and now uh, we did the calculation and yeah maybe we look at this formula again this is the final formula for determining our parameters and this is really easy it's really easy I mean even if you didn't understand anything uh, in this derivation this is very easy to apply so you just have to to calculate this uh, matrix F which comes from um, which is a matrix of all our basis functions applied to all data points. Yeah? Um, yeah. And uh, the result is, um, I mean, I don't look at this really simple example. We go back to, yeah. So what we then did is we applied this Bayesian linear regression again to the same problem. So the same data points coming from this um, uh, sine function and then with the ninth order polynomial. Here we have maximum likelihood and here uh, Bayesian, uh, Bayesian regression. And uh, so, I mean here you don't see too much of a difference. Ah, already you see that the Bayesian approach does not hit all the data points. So already here you see that it's, it doesn't as much as maximum likelihood tend to overfit. Huh? So already here there is some smoothing. Um, and here even more. Here you can really see that uh, you get quite a smooth curve uh, in contrast to the overfitting here. And here again, and here too. And yeah, even here. Okay, yeah. And now, um, yeah, let's uh, summarize. Let's do a summary on linear regression. I mean, we are, we are getting towards the end of this regression uh, chapter. Um, oh, sorry, this is not in your, uh, in your handouts. Uh, I, I, I mean, I always do quite hard in printing stuff. I tried it this morning, so these are like four copies, but uh, 20 more copies should be on the printer, so if one of you two guys would like to walk over, there should be something like 20 more copies on the printer. Drüben am Drucker im... Yeah. So it's four sheets, I guess, uh, yeah, I think it's four sheets. Okay, so the basic ansatz is this, linear combination of k basis functions. So we have k unknown parameters, a1 through a k, um, to be determined from n data points. Uh, and I mean, in most applications, n is much larger than k. Uh, and this is the, the realistic case. And this is also the case where you, 
where you typically may get good results. If the number of parameters is larger than the number of data points, something is going wrong. Huh? So you shouldn't, you shouldn't do this. Huh? In most cases, you won't get good results if you have more parameters than data points. So typically, actually, the number of parameters should be much smaller than the number of data points. OK, so now the first step is we substitute the points into our constraints. Um, and these are the constraints. So we, yeah, we would like to hit all the points. But of course, if the number of parameters is smaller than the number of points, if you look, if we substitute this ansatz here into all these uh, these constraints, then we get this is f of f of x, huh? f of x1, and this has to be equal to y1. So this gives our first equality, um, and then we get n such for every point we get one such equation. So now at the end we do have a linear system with n equations for k unknowns. And you see, we do get an overdetermined linear system. So that's the, or, the old problem. We did this already, you remember, when we did uh, least squares, the pseudo-inverse method. And the pseudo-inverse method, you also remember, pseudo-inverse can also be applied um, even in the underdetermined case. Yeah? Then you, then you have to replace M transpose by M and it would also work. <coughs> okay. And in matrix notation, it's this. This matrix M times A is equal to Y with Mij is Fj of Xi. So it's really basic to set up this matrix M and then you have to, yeah, then you have to solve this linear system. But it's an overdetermined linear system, and you know you, you can apply the pseudo inverse method. Huh? Okay. Um, yes. So this is the case of overdetermined, and uh, in, in the under, underdetermined case, um, we, will, we will look in a few minutes again on the underdetermined case. Okay. Um, and we, we have seen a number of different solution techniques and that's what we want to review again. So in the overdetermined case, we had least squares and pseudo-inverse, which is actually the same. Then we looked at maximum likelihood and at Bayesian linear regression. And in the underdetermined case, we only know the pseudo-inverse method up to now. But this case is not so important in real applications. OK, and now let's compare the results. So when we did least squares, we minimize something. Some quantity did we minimize. And what was it? Yeah, it was actually the um, m times a minus y and the square norm of this. Why did we minimize this quantity? I mean, look at our original problem. This is our problem. But unfortunately, M is not an invertible square matrix. It's not even square. And what is the reason why we minimize this quantity? I mean, this really, uh, I mean, you have to know this from now on and you never forget it, yeah? please. Uh, that's so basic. And, and I mean, if you, if you understand this, you're kind of on the next level of understanding math. And this is nothing about ugly proofs. It's so basic. Why do we minimize this? It's really, really simple. Minimize 
the error between the curve and the points. Yes, that's what we minimize. But let me again ask, why is this the distance between the curve and the points? Is this obvious to everybody? Maybe we look at, the, at our equation again. If we have m times a vector is equal to y vector, that's what we would like to have, but we can't get it because it's overdetermined. Now we bring this y to the other side and this should be equal to zero, but we can't get it equal to zero. And now what we do is we relax this constraint. Now our requirements are weaker. So we say we want to to get as close to zero as possible. So we, we minimize uh, the two norm of this, the Euclidean norm of this. Uh, that's what we did. And I mean, it's reason, reasonable to do this. But let me tell you here, there are different ways. We don't need to uh, use the, the two norm. We can use any p norm here. Uh, we could even use the maximum norm or what, what people quite often do is they use the, the one norm or also called L1 norm. Huh? Um, but what we did is we did it with the two norm because this is mathematically the easiest way. Huh? Because when you take the two norm, uh, look back in the script at the least squares derivation. There you will see if we use the Euclidean norm, then after calculating the derivative, we get a linear system. And that's nice, isn't it? And if you use the one norm, the one norm, um, there, uh, there you have just the absolute value of all the components. And that's not nice mathematically, because the absolute value is, it looks like that. So x and the absolute value of x and it's not differentiable in the origin and that's not nice because the origin is the region of interest for us. Huh? And that's why we don't uh, look at this. Okay, but there are nowadays also methods, mathematical methods, algorithms for minimizing the L1 norm. And you would get different results. Okay, and the result is this function to determine, look, and now we have this a hat because it's only an approximation to the solution of our original equation. Okay, and now uh, the next step was we applied maximum likelihood and uh, so we maximized this conditional probability, which is the likelihood for observing all the points, and the result is exactly the same as least squares. And that's nice because now we know that the, the original naive least squares is, it tends to overfit. It tends to overfit. That's what we have seen in the maximum likelihood example. But we know, we know a better solution which is Bayesian linear regression and what we did there is um, the so-called, uh, we cal calculated the so-called MAP hypothesis, maximum uh, a posteriori probability, maximum posterior probability. Huh? Um, yeah, so now we maximize this posterior probability and the as a result we get this formula. And now if you compare this formula to this, then you see um, there is this added term. And a term lambda times the identity matrix. And this term um, reduces overfitting. And uh, I mean, this parameter lambda, this is an open parameter which will not be determined automatically by this method. So you as a user 
have to fix this parameter lambda. Uh, but I mean, at least at the moment, we should see this as a freedom for us to reduce overfitting. Because I mean, if you have no idea, you can always use lambda equal to zero, and then you have the maximum likelihood solution. Uh, um, and then if you see in your results, oh, this looks like overfitting, then you can increase lambda a little bit from zero. Uh, Okay, yeah. Um, and there is another method which we... Uh, did we treat it in the lecture? I don't remember actually. Did we do regularized least squares? Sorry, I don't remember. Um, okay, but le lo let's look at it. Regularized least squares is, it is least squares. We minimize this quantity, but with some added regularization term. And this is really intuitive. If we minimize only this quantity, then we get this result, and we get overfitting effects. OK, and what does overfitting mean? Let's look at the polynomial uh, case again. If we have such four points and like a polynomial of degree 9, then we would get something like that. Huh? We get overfitting. What does that mean? I mean, this means this polynomial of degree 9, it wants to oscillate. Yeah? And I mean, now we have to force this polynomial not to oscillate that much. I mean, the least oscillation a polynomial can do is this. A constant function is a polynomial um, with all coefficients but the the lowest order coefficient being zero. When all coefficients are zero, then you can be sure there is not much overfitting. At least, I mean, of course, if the points are all on one line, uh, but this is the trivial case. But if the points are not on one line, you have the opposite of overfitting, okay? And so that's, we try to get our parameters as small as possible, as close to zero as possible. So now what we want to do is we minimize our objective function, which is the, the two norm of m a minus y, and we add such a regularization term. That's what we call a regularization term. So we add lambda times the two norm of our parameter vector. Huh? Because we want to get these coefficients small. Huh? So we also want to minimize these coefficients. And the, I mean, the not trivial question is, how should we weight this minimization of the parameters? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on actually what you want. It depends on the noise level, on the noise you have. If there is zero noise, um, then you really want to hit all the points. But if there is um, a high noise level, then uh, you really want to have strong smoothing and then you want to have a larger lambda. Yeah? And if you look back into the maximum likely, uh, sorry, in the Bayesian linear regression derivation, then you see that actually the sigma, the variance of the, the original noise, is part of lambda. This lambda, I don't remember. So lambda is um, equal to the, um, I guess the, yeah, the noise uh, sigma, sigma divided by alpha something. Maybe it was sigma squared. I don't remember exactly. But this sigma is the, the variance of the noise in our data, and this alpha is the parameter prior 
for the Bayesian regression. So the, the noise level of, of our data actually is part of lambda. But when you practically apply this method, so at least for me it's easier to just determine lambda. Yeah? Uh, because then you don't have to think about two parameters. So applying regularized least squares, you have this lambda here, and then you can manually set this lambda. And I mean, there are techniques uh, which even can automatically adjust this parameter lambda, but le this leads too far here at the moment. So we, at, uh, at the moment, we fix our lambda manually. Okay, and now, I mean, this is, this is not really difficult. This is actually this, uh, almost the same as we had here. And if we calculate the derivative with, with respect to this parameter vector, set it equal to zero, then that's what we get as a result. And this is nice again. And now again you see this is the same result as we got from the Bayesian treatment. So you see regularized least squares is equivalent to Bayesian linear regression and maximizing the, the posterior probability. And the original least squares is equivalent to maximum likelihood. Yeah? And I mean, that's, that's really nice uh, that we, from the Bayesian treatment, we get kind of an explanation uh, for the regularization uh, term. Okay, yeah. Any questions about this summary slide here? And with this slide, you can go into the applications and uh, basically you can forget all the theory. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, we have to talk about the underdetermined case uh, also. So, in the underdetermined case, um, I mean, here we have a different problem. Look. Let's let's take an example. Simple example. So now the, no, the number of points has to be um, smaller than the number of unknown parameters. So let's take two points and a polynomial of degree 2, which is a parabola, with three parameters. And of course, we get infinitely many solutions. And now, I mean, from linear algebra, you know, okay, you can freely select one of these infinitely many parabolas. Huh? But, I mean, this is not really satisfactory because we want to have deterministic systems, deterministic algorithms, which don't randomly select something. Yeah? Um, and do you remember what we did here? when we, when we uh, derived the pseudo-inverse method for the underdetermined case. What did we do here? Pseudo-inverse on the equation of a line minimum values. Of a line? No. No, no. The pseudo-inverse method can be applied to any linear regression. Yeah? And please don't mix up linear regression with determining the coefficients of a straight line. No. Linear regression is this. But inside this M are hidden nonlinear basis functions. In the exam it was a line. In the exam it was a line. Yeah, okay, fine. Uh, but in the next exam, it won't be a line. What did we do when we derived this formula, this pseudo-inverse formula? 
because this formula is something different from just taking randomly one of these infinitely many solutions. I mean, if we would take randomly one of these solutions, then you would take the original linear system and would, you would do Gaussian elimination and then you would, uh, you would uh, have some columns remaining which you couldn't solve and then you get a linear combination of some parameters and you can select anything. Yeah? But that's what we did not do because we wanted to have a unique solution. What did we do? Let me tell you something. What we did actually was regularize least squares. That's what we did in the underdetermined case. We did nothing but this. Yeah? So we, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, it, what we did was a little bit different, but it was almost this. Yeah? I mean, here you see it. We minimize, yeah, it's, it's, it is actually a little bit different. We really have to change our viewpoint here. We do, we do not minimize this quantity because it is already zero. We actually have infinitely many solutions which make this equal to zero. So minimizing this doesn't make any sense. Huh? But of course we have to fulfill we have to exactly fulfill this equation. So what we now do is we take the true norm of our parameter vector and that's what we, we also added the true norm of the parameter vector as a regularization term in the overdetermined case. And now in the underdetermined case we have to ask a different question. The question is no longer how can we solve this linear system because it is already solved. The question now is how can we select out of these infinitely many solutions a good one, the best one. Huh? So now we have to find a different optimization criterion. Huh? And now we say okay let's minimize our parameter values. So again, as in the overdetermined case with the regularization parameter, we want to get our parameters as close to zero as possible. Because again, here we have some freedom uh, with our parameters. I mean, here actually we really have freedom. Here we really have freedom. Before, we, uh, it was kind of uh, a compromise. We were looking for a compromise between um, hitting the points and smoothing the whole thing. Yeah? But here we already have hit all the points. And now what we want is, look, I mean in this case uh, the reasonable solution would be this straight line and not such a parabola. Yeah? And now if we try to get our parameters as small as possible um, then maybe the solution is the straight line or at least it maybe it is something like that. Huh? Okay. And that's quite interesting. So we have actually a lack of information. Let's see it like that. I mean if we would have a third point here we would have a unique solution. But this third point is missing. So there is information is missing. Yeah? And how do we fill this gap of missing information? Yeah, we fill it by using, by minimizing some quantity. And this, I mean, you might call this an ad hoc selection. And again, of course, we also might minimize the L1 norm of our parameter vector or the 3 norm or the 17 norm, whatever. But because doing it with the 2 norm is mathematically the easiest thing and it gives reasonable results, that's why we do this. 
Okay, so I hope you now get a little bit uh, the bigger picture of the whole thing we did. I, I mean, I know and I have seen that you're really down into the details and maybe sometimes you have been lost, but I hope now you get kind of the bigger picture from the airplane and you see all these mountains and hills and at least part of the nice landscape. Maybe there are some clouds in between, but uh, they will vanish. Uh, the weather forecast is not too bad. Uh, a few clouds today and tomorrow. But, yeah. but I mean, if you do some exercise stuff, and, and I will provide you uh, some new exercises. I didn't have the time over the weekend because I had to do all this preparation, but you will get some exercises, I guess, today or tomorrow. Okay, yeah, and, and now uh, a few words to the, the computer science students who had the AI lecture last semester because you already remember something like that. Huh? Uh, a case where we had missing information and we had to fill the gap of missing information and then we maximized some quantity and that's what we did is we maximize the entropy of a probability distribution under given constraints. That's the case where we have probabilistic knowledge, so we know some probabilities of our world, but <coughs> I mean we, we have seen how to calculate the size of the full distribution and we would need to know 2 power n values in case of binary of n binary variables and if the number of values probability values we have is maybe much smaller then we have a lack of information we have missing knowledge and now we and then we fill this gap by maximizing the entropy of these discrete distributions why did we use the entropy there why didn't we minimize the true norm of our probabilities? Why did we maximize the entropy? It's, it's basically the same thing we do here, but we, we optimize the different function, the entropy. Oh, you should remember. Because we don't want to add knowledge. Yes, I mean, that's the reason why we, we changed our viewpoint and said, okay, we don't want to add ad hoc knowledge. Look, in the AI case, adding ad hoc knowledge would be like adding a third point here. If we would ad hoc here add a third point, this would be adding ad hoc knowledge. And this is not allowed. Yeah? Because Adding a third point is the same as selecting one of these parabolas. Huh? That's what we did not want to do in AI, neither do we want to do it here in math. Huh? Um, but this does not answer the question why we uh, uh, maximize the entropy. Why do we select the entropy function and not minimize the, the two norm of the parameter vector? We could have done this, actually. You may go back to the AI uh, exercises and not maximize the entropy, but minimize the Euclidean norm of the parameters. That's possible, too. It's actually easier because you get a linear system. But we did not do this. Why? OK, I don't want to, to be boring to the other students so long. Uh, the answer was the entropy, and actually Claude Shannon in the 1940s proved that the entropy is the function to measure information contents in a probabilistic setting. Yeah? And of course we want to minimize the extra information we put into the system. So we can't do anything better than uh, maximizing the entropy. Yeah? Um, and actually it would be nice to test what happens here if we maximize the entropy of our parameter vector 
I mean, of course, before we, you can maximize the entropy, you would have to normalize, um, but that would be possible. That would be interesting. But let's go back to the AI case. In the AI case, we could have done this too. And I'm, I mean, uh, I have read a book about maximum entropy and uh, there is a nice book with many applications and this guy, he writes in his book that some people even do this. They minimize the square norm of the parameter vector in the probabilistic setting and the results are not so much different from the entropy. And why? Look, the two norm of the parameter vector is equal to the sum over i a i squared and the square root of this. Okay? Um, and if we take the square of the two norm, then the, the, the root actually vanishes and it doesn't matter because um, eliminating the square root, because it's strictly monotonic, it doesn't matter in, in optimization. Okay, and now if we look at the entropy, h of such an a, a vector a, it's minus the sum over i, a i, ln a i. And now compare this to that. Look, here we have a i times a i. So this is the same, and here we replace AI by the, the log of AI. So it's not so much different. Um, and um, of course, replacing AI by the log of AI, and these values are between 0 and 1, and here the log is negative. Here we have 1, uh, the logarithm is negative, and that's why we have to replace the minus sign by a plus here. So, or um, minimizing this is similar to maximizing this. Or if we delete the minus here, we maximize this function or this. And uh, so AI and ln AI, they are monotonic. Uh, so the, this is a monotonic function of this. So. I mean, of course, this is not the same. This is not the same. Maximizing this is not the same as maximizing this. But Kapoor and Kesawan in their book, they claim the results are quite similar. Okay, any questions about the AI stuff? Yeah? Oh, this is the entropy. I mean, shall we now step a little bit into AI? Uh, we could do so. Who, who would be interested? Only you and you. So maybe you come to my office later and we discuss it uh, individually. Yeah? Um, and I mean, if you don't dare to come to my office, read my book. Yeah? <laughs> And it's now, it's now available in English by Springer. Oops. Um, and it's in, a, in our library also. So, um, and it's, it's, really, it's a really nice section, uh, this entropy maximization, isn't it? You all liked it very much, did you? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite sections, actually. Um, and we did, we, we, we built this successful Lexmate uh, appendicitis diagnosis system, uh, which was successfully ap applied in clinical applications. Okay, okay, so no more, no more questions. Now uh, let's continue repeating the stuff. Huh? What we do now is, with this radial basis uh, sec function section, is nothing but applying the pseudo-inverse method to one nice and concrete example. Huh? Um, and, oh yeah, let me say a few, a few things about the script. I mean, here the script is kind of quite lengthy. We, I could have done the whole thing and say, okay, 
the, as the basis functions, we use uh, Gaussian uh, functions. And now we apply pseudo inverse, and this is the result. That's what I could have done. But I, I mean, I wouldn't have written so much text in the script. This is from Haitam Buamar, who gave this part of the lecture one year ago. And I mean, he was lucky to write so much text. And I guess it's very helpful for you, yeah? because it's written from a different person. It's the same thing, again, written by someone else. And so you may get a different viewpoint, and this may help you in understanding the whole thing. Yeah? Um, and I mean, I tried to make the notation consistent with what I used before, because it was not, uh, it was not perfect. And maybe um, I made some little errors, maybe I forgot to change something. So if there are some inconsistencies, please tell me or please ask me, and then I can correct it. Yeah? Okay, so I mean again, um, given our n data points, um, xi, yi, oh yeah, here he says it's yi hat. Okay, look, there is some first um, minor difference. And I mean, he calls it yi hat because of the Gaussian noise he assumes to be added to this underlying function which we don't know. And the assumption again is Gaussian noise with zero mean and some variance. Okay, and we do, we do want to fit a linear model which is nothing new at all. And now the, the, the example we use here is we use radial basis functions. So these basis functions are now, and you see, these are basically Gaussian functions. The only thing we omitted here is the, the, the normalization factor because it's irrelevant. Because we want to adjust these parameters anyway. Uh, um, and you see a Gaussian function with a center, a CJ, and a variance sigma squared. Yeah. And every one of these basis functions has a different center, um, but one fixed sigma. Uh, so that's the assumption. The sigma for all our basis functions is the same, but they have different centers. Now let's look at this picture here. Um, oh, actually in this picture the sigmas are not the same. Sorry. But I mean, this is just to illustrate what's a Gaussian function. Here we have this one and this one and this one. And now the black function is a linear combination of these three Gaussian kernels. Yeah. And yeah, it's a linear combination with these parameters. A1 equal 0.4, so 0.4 times this function plus 0.7 times the green plus 0.9 times the blue. Uh, which gives as a result this. Uh. Yeah. And I mean, using such Gaussian basis functions is actually a good idea. Um, at least if we compare it to using polynomials. Because, I mean, polynomials tend to diverge. The higher the degree of our polynomial becomes, the more steep they want to diverge and the, the more ugly are the oscillations we get. But these functions, I mean, they tend to go to zero. So any such radial basis function only has an influence in some region around the center. So it's more or less something like plus minus two sigma, and outside of this area there is no more influence from such a radial basis functions. And now if you finally distribute the centers of these basis functions appropriately, you might get quite nice results. 
Yeah, let's look at it. Oh yeah, uh, let's look now at a different viewpoint. I mean, there are people who call these radial basis linear regression, they call this neural networks. I don't like it, but in many books uh, people call this neural network. Huh? And you can do it. Look, here we have our input variables, x1 through xn. Huh? Um, let me see, is this an n or is it an m? I guess it's an n and so um, it, yeah. So this n here should not, uh, this should not be an n, sorry, please correct it, it should be a d. A d because d here is the dimension of our input space. Huh? Um, here, d dimensional input vector x. So this is our input vector x with d dimensions. And now every one of these basis functions gets this d-dimensional input vector as an input. As you can see here, the first basis function gets all the vector as input. The second two, the third, and so on. And there is the next error on this slide. I mean, that's, I mean, I made the notation consi consistent. Here it's called phi 1 through phi uh, k. Yeah? Um, but it should be f1 through fk. Huh? And again here, this formula inside here, the sum, yeah, let me write on the blackboard. So it should be the sum over i equal 1 through k a i f i of x vector. That's what it should be. And there is the sum over w i W J phi J of X. Huh? I mean, I didn't want to draw all this picture again. Oh, it's, oh it's, it's actually written here on the slide also. Okay, so now every one of these basis functions gets the vector as an input and then what we do is, what we have here is the linear combination of the basis functions. That's all. And I mean, that's called neural network. And in, in the ne neural network term terminology, this is the input layer, this is the hidden layer, and this is the output layer. And we, we would then say we have a hidden layer with k radial basis functions as activation function. And, uh, and this is a linear output unit. Uh, but, I mean, calling this an, a neural network is quite artificial. Okay, yeah. And now we, we, we solve the least squares problem for this set of basis functions, which, which is nothing new at all. Here we have the, uh, the error function, uh, and minimization means determining the minimum of the error function and then, uh, yeah, actually determining these parameters, that's why we have the argmin, because the min would just give us some error, but we want to know the parameters. So that's the formal notation of what we did all the time. Okay, yeah, and of course, there, there will be our matrix M, which is well known. This is the matrix containing um, so the columns of this matrix are the individual basis functions applied to all our data points. Huh? Um, and the rows, each, each one of these rows 
is the vector of basis functions applied to one data point. Okay, and in, in, in this matrix notation our error function is this, um, minimization with respect to A uh, gives us this equation which actually in the overdetermined case has no solution and we apply the pseudo inverse solution yeah okay and now we look at some examples this is a, a very simple example with three data points these are the points one two and three um, yeah and now yeah what we do in the let's say in the naivest, in the naivest way is to um, to put the centers of our Gaussians at the data points. So the center of Gaussian number one is here. This is the first center, C1. The second center is here, C2. And the third center is here. C3. So now we determine three Gaussians with these centers. So this is the naivest way. So we don't have to bother with finding the centers of our uh, distributions. We just fix them at the data points. And we do it now because it's so simple. And we can discuss later whether this is a good idea or not. But let's just do it. And if we fix these centers for our Gaussians and we take um, a small variance, sigma, sigma equal 0.1, then what, what we get as a result is this green dashed function. To approximate these three data points. And I guess this wouldn't make us happy. Huh? Because it looks like the overfitting effects we get from polynomials. But actually this is not surprising. This is not surprising because what did we do? We have uh, three points and we determine um, three coefficients of uh, three basis functions. So we, we actually do uh, the same thing as we, as we did with polynomial interpolation. Of course we hit all the points. So this combination of three uh, radial basis functions hits all three points but in between we get these oscillations. Yeah, um, but now we can kind of repair this problem by increasing sigma, by just increasing sigma. If we take sigma equal 0.5, then this is what we get. And if we even take sigma equal to 8, this is what we get. And I mean, if you for a moment forget this part and this part of the blue uh, function, this is a nice result. This is actually what, if I would give you these three points and would ask you to draw a smooth uh, line through them, it might look like that. And I mean, we shouldn't worry about this and about that because this is outside of our interval of interest. Yeah. <coughs> okay, yeah. Now this is again about the overfitting problem. I, uh, I guess I, I said all this. If the number of basis functions is the same as the number of training examples, that's what we had. Yeah? And um, 
and if the centers of the RBFs are equal to the input points, then we do have interpolation rather than approximation. And what we get is something like that. Suppose this, the dashed line here, it's a sine function. Suppose this is the underlying function and you have some added noise on the data points. If then you would do this, you would get a result which looks like that. And that is not surprising at all. So here with, the, with radial basis functions, we have two, actually two ways to solve the problem. Method number one is, what we have just seen is, we increase sigma. Huh? And then we will get some smoothing. But what is method number two? I mean, there are actually many ways out of this problem. We can increase sigma. Oh, remember what I just uh, showed you in our summary? Look, now we have overfitting with least squares. What is our way to solve the overfitting problem? Regularization. regularization. We could of course add the regularization term and we would now, I mean, we would not solve this equation or take this formula. We just add lambda plus the identity here. That's all we do and then we get some smoothing again. Yeah? So now we have two ways to solve the problem and we will, we will uh, now look at a third way to solve the problem. Yeah, okay, yeah. So we get high oscillations, huh? that's our problem. And, oh yes, and, and uh, there are more problems. If we use one basis function for each training data pattern and now assume the number of data points is large, like 10,000, then we do have 10,000 basis functions. And that would lead us to computational problems because, look at this formula, we have to invert this, this square matrix. And what is the dimension of this square matrix? Look, you have to do exercises now. I mean, that's, you should know this. Yeah? The dimension of this resulting matrix is the number of basis functions, okay? And now if the number of basis functions is the same as the number of points and the number of points is 10,000, <laughs> then you have to invert a 10,000 by 10,000 metric, which is quite large and would cost you a lot of computation time. <coughs> so you, we do have an overfitting problem and a computational problem. So this is actually not a good idea to use for every data point an individual radial basis function. Uh -huh. um, okay, so what we want to have is that the number of basis functions should be less than n. Uh -huh. Okay, and, but now we lose this rule of thumb, just put a basis function at every data point. Now the question is where should we put these few radial basis functions. Maybe we have 10,000 points, but we want to use only 25 basis functions. Where should we put the centers? That's now the, the questions. Yeah? Um, and there are methods for determining these centers automatically. Yeah? Um, yes. Um, and the width parameters, sigma i, they can actually be, of course, made individual. So now every uh, radial basis function gets its own sigma, but of course the problem doesn't become easier because now we also have to determine these uh, sigma i individually. Huh? Um, oh yes, and also we will introduce such a bias parameter, which is also quite a good idea because 
Yeah, why do we need this? Look, if we have something like that, like three radial basis functions, and we take the sum of these guys, then the resulting function is it, it's more or less this. But in between these basis functions, it will always become zero. And now if we want to, to shift the whole thing away from zero, maybe down there or somewhere, we can achieve this by adding such one, one such constant coefficient, which is called a bias parameter. I mean, this is nothing but, that's the same as if you would add one extra basis function, which is the constant function f of x equal to 1. So f, f0 of x would be equal to 1. If you would add such, one such extra basis function, then that's what you, what you have. Okay, yeah. Um, and now there are ways, I mean, this is, this is advanced and we don't go into the details. I just give you the ideas. What uh, one could do is um, actually regularization. So we take the, the normal error term plus lambda times some regularization term and uh, people suggest to use here as a regularization term the gradient of this uh, matrix F containing all the functions applied to all the data points because, I mean, look, uh, inside here we have this matrix F. Huh? Um, and what we have here is the gradient of this F and this makes the whole solution even smoother. Um, but again, you see, you have such a regularization parameter, lambda. But we, go into the, we don't go into this because if you do this, then uh, the final uh, system of equations that you get is nonlinear. Huh? And then it's getting non-trivial because then you have to uh, apply methods from uh, nonlinear equation solving or uh, in particular, you have to uh, apply iterative algorithms for finding such a minimum. There are such algorithms and we talked about such algorithms in the AI lecture but here we don't want to go into this. Huh? Um, what we do here is we use some simpler method. We use some simpler method for determining the centers of our basis functions which is clustering. Um, and again, I mean, uh, the computer science students who had AI, they know what clustering means, but for you I will explain it, but we don't go into the details of clustering algorithms. But in, I mean, in, in, one, in the one-dimensional case of our examples here, clustering is quite simple. But yeah, let me show it in the two-dimensional case because here it's really nice. Yeah? So we have now um, data two-dimensional, x1 and x2. And um, suppose our data are um, distributed like that with lower density in between these clusters. Yeah. And now what, what does our least squares method with radial basis functions do? I mean here it would make sense to take one radial basis function with this center and another one with the center here in the middle of this cluster. Yeah. And then um, um, the clustering algorithms would maybe determine, okay, this is cluster number one and maybe this is cluster number two. Yeah? 
And what we then do is, as a next step, we uh, compute the covariance matrix of this cluster and this cluster. You know how to do this from PCA. Yeah? And once you have the covariance matrix and you have the center, I mean, then you're basically finished. Because then you, you take a normal distribu uh, distribution with this center and this covariance matrix and then you, these would be the contour lines of uh, basis function number one and these would be the contour lines of basis function number two. Oh yes, but are we finished? No, there is something still to do. So this would be F1 of X vector and this guy would be F2 of X vector. But that's not what we are looking for. We are looking for one function that describes all data points. What are we looking for? We are looking for a function f of x vector which is a 0 plus a1 f1 of x plus a2 f2 of x. That's what we want. So what is missing? Missing are these three guys here. Um, but the good thing is f1 is a radial basis function and we already know the center and the covariance matrix. And for f2 also we know the center and the covariance matrix. The only thing that's missing are these three parameters. So now we apply our um, least squares method or maybe regularized least squares and then we have these parameters and we are finished. And I will give you some exercises like that. What's about the data points that are not included in those classes? I mean these data points here they will be not relevant for determining the mu's and the sigmas here, but they will be re relevant for determining these coefficients. Yeah? So we will use all the data points when we do least squares, but not uh, when we determine the mu's and the sigmas. Yeah? But uh, I mean, we didn't talk about the clustering algorithms. Huh? Clustering actually is not really difficult. If you look into my, uh, my AI book, into the clustering chapter, the k-means algorithm is really simple. But I mean, I can explain it to you if you want. Yeah, you want? Everybody? Who does not want me to talk about k-means? Oh, we should finish. But uh, I mean, there is Wednesday too. So, uh, shall I explain k-means on Wednesday? Who want me? Uh, raise your hands. Okay, so all mechatronic students. And you can then sleep for 10 minutes, huh? or maybe 15 minutes. Yeah, okay, so uh, shall we stop now? No, let me finish uh, this here, one or, more, uh, one or two more slides. Okay, yeah, this k-means algorithm one point is I have to know in advance how many clusters I want. That's not so nice, but that's as it is. Yeah? Determining the number of clusters is a not trivial task, so you should know about the number of clusters or you just try it. You try it with two clusters, with four clusters, six, eight, ten, and then you would look with which partitioning you get the best results. But this k-means algorithm automatically gives you the clusters and I will show you on Wednesday how it works. Huh? Oh yes, and it's important, this k, this is a capital K. It's not like the lowercase k, uh, which is the number of basis functions. Huh? Okay, yeah, and uh, we don't continue with the clustering and um, yeah. Yeah, actually we, we, we can finish here. Thank you.